The Hawaii Supreme Court picks the aloha spirit over gun rights. Plus, an interview with nonprofit law professor James Fishman on the NRA's ongoing corruption trial. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also a CNN contributor and the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over for, to sign up for our free newsletter. If you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America, you can also, of course, buy a membership to The Reload if you want to get even more information and dive really deep into the topics at hand uh, and, of course, support our important reporting that we do here as an independent publication. This week, we are discussing... Well, once again, the NRA and its corruption trial, that is uh, kind of the biggest story, I think, in guns at the moment as this drags on. And, you know, I think it's important, uh, as we try to do with this show, to have experts on who can speak specifically to the topic at hand, which is why I have uh, Pace University professor uh, Jim Fishman on this week. Welcome to the show, uh, Professor. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. And can you tell people just a little bit more about your background and You've been cited quite a lot in reporting on this case. Uh, can you just give people a little, a little bit about your history and the things that you cover? Okay, I uh, have uh, been involved in in terms of my research with uh, the non nonprofit organizations for 30 some years. And before that, I worked uh, as the executive director of two nonprofits um, and uh, have written a lot in the area. I'm a co-author of uh, a case book on uh, nonprofit organizations with two other uh, law professors, uh, which uh, is in its sixth edition, and uh, also a co-author of a, a treatise with uh, two practitioners, three practitioners actually now, that's in its third edition with an annual supplement called uh, New York Not-for-Profit Law and Practice with a Tax Analysis. So I've been, and I'm, I also serve in, on the boards of uh, several nonprofits. So I, I've been involved in the in the nonprofit world. Yes, yes, that's putting it lightly, I think. Yeah. Uh, but you also have specific knowledge of New York nonprofit law, which is what really matters yeah. for the NRA because that's where they're chartered and that's where this case is is mm -hmm. happening, right? And that's correct. And, and so let's uh, just get the, the basics of this case. The NRA has been accused, well, the NRA has been accused of operating under an environment where its leadership could use charity funds or nonprofit funds on lavish personal expenses, right? That's, and this, that, that this situation has been, it stretches back decades really is the accusation. Um, and that, yeah, I, the, I think we, that it's sort of ongoing issues as well. Uh, that that's the core of, of this case, right? That's those are the claims. Yeah, we, we really ought to start though with the NRA uh, was really a uh, kind of one of these iconic nonprofits, like I don't know the Girl Scouts or the Red Cross. It was nonpartisan, uh, and the reason was that its main effort was uh, educating young people how to use guns responsibly. responsibly. Uh, and it was it was not a political organization uh, that really uh, has been the gift of Mr. Lapierre uh, in terms of changing it from an organization that uh, really was in favor of, of guns, of course, but the proper use of them. And in fact, um, the NRA was not against the original ban on assault rifles. Uh, and but then everything changed, and it uh, really became a political organization uh, linked very closely to uh, extremely conservative uh, Republican uh, Republicans, uh, and also uh, redefining, helping to redefine the Second Amendment. Right. Uh, well, and well, certainly, uh, you know, Wayne Lapierre's. Uh, Legacy is is heavily involved with the politics of the NRA, and and uh, yeah. you know you can. There's obviously a, a whole I think podcast topic to do on the NRA and why it changed, especially at the time the period of time that it did when there was 
yeah. to be fair to the NRA, a, a much greater push for new gun restrictions than there had been previously to that point, especially on the federal level. So, um, but that's not really the, well, there are, there are, the politics is at play in this case, right? And, and we'll, we'll talk, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that, especially the, uh, the NRA's defense involves uh, the politics to some degree right um and we'll talk about that and why uh it hasn't worked to this point or or how they've tried to incorporate it in the case regardless um but first you know the claims at least in the in the case don't stem from wayne lapierre's political beliefs or the way that he's used uh the nra to influence uh you know congressional races or presidential races or legislation that's going through they, they stem from uh, his his use of NRA funds for things like private yeah, it was flights. Yeah, a, a and, personal piggy bank, mm -hmm. basically. Right. He used it as a personal piggy bank. That's that's uh, the accusation, your, right? And so, so yeah. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, the case has been we we've got through the the AG's part of the case uh, already. We're on to the defense section. Looks like there's about a week left after uh, after this point. Closing arguments are are set to happen on the 15th of February. So we're pretty far along. I assume you've been following sort of the the way it's gone so far. Can you just give us uh, to start here your your view of how the case is unfolding? Yeah, well, it's certainly been a long time coming. Um, basically, the NRA has lost at every stage, uh, save for the, uh, it was, able to prevent being dissolved, which it requests. That was one of James's requests. And the court said no. However, everything else has really gone the attorney general's way as it should, uh, because uh, what LaPierre did uh, and also just the violations of standard uh, New York not-for-profit requirements and practices. Um, he basically was taking money out of the kitty without getting the appropriate approvals and uh, doing other things, attempting other things when James brought suit that were extraordinary. For instance, uh, what the NRA has been trying to do was to uh, move out of New York to go to Texas, where they think that it will be looked upon more favorably. Uh, one way they tried to do this was to declare bankruptcy. Right. LaPierre never told his general counsel that uh, the organization was going to declare bankruptcy. Uh, LaPierre just went to court and tried to do it himself. And uh, it was, I guess, a Texas court. And the court said, you know, we're not going to allow this. Uh, so he's tried to do everything to avoid this. Also, the sorts of things he was engaged in uh, are so outrageous that uh, it's just hard to believe that he had the nerve to do it. Um, it is estimated that he took personally millions of dollars that he essentially gave to uh, his friends, to others on the board, uh, things of that sort. Uh, generally, when you are asked to, if you're ever asked to join the board of a nonprofit organization, you've got two questions you should raise. One, do you have directors and officers liability insurance? And the second question is, what is the give or get? In other words, most directors of a nonprofit organization are expected to make a charitable contribution or to raise the money. Uh, in the case of the NRA, it was one of the rare situations where the give uh, or getting, the giving was by the organization to the other directors. They had a board of 76, and many of them also were on the gravy train uh, in terms of getting contracts, uh, in terms of getting other kinds of benefits. Uh, none of the benefits were as outrageous as LaPierre's. Um, $250,000 for uh, expenditures in a uh, clothing boutique in Beverly Hills for himself. 
um, free airfare for uh, non-NRA events for his wife, relatives, not to speak of himself. So the sorts of things that were done were particularly outrageous, and there was no attempt really to sanitize them. In other words, you can have a conflict of interest, and there are procedures under New York law, which the board takes, to approve it, uh, so long as there's full disclosure, think of that sort. None of that was there with the NRA. So, all right. So you're these, uh, as far as the most egregious accusations that you've seen in this case, they relate to the, um, the board being paid, uh, for, for various things. Um, the, uh, sort of related party transactions, uh, where mm -hmm. LaPierre was, um, sort of giving gifts with NRA money or, or receiving gifts from top contractors that then. Yeah. Or contracts. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you know, and the other way it worked, uh, LaPierre went on super luxury, con uh, super luxury yachts with uh, the McKenzie friends and family, yeah. um, made all sorts of deals with people who were selling things, vendors to the NRA and things like that. And other board members uh, also received uh, a lot from much was coming from the NRA's treasury. Mm -hmm. So there really was a lot of misdealing going on. Okay. Um, and, and so, you know, you've got that, that set of facts or accusation. I know they've admitted to some of these things, right? There's not a lot of dispute over whether uh, a number of these transactions happened, right? There's, the, I don't believe there's been much disputing that these payments were made. Um, no. There's uh, what you have so far as the NRA's defense goes uh, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this and, and how viable it is. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, their argument is there were some bad actors um, or some of the leadership made mistakes, such as Wayne LaPierre, but they've reformed internally. They have put in new controls. Uh, Wayne LaPierre, for instance, paid about a million dollars back in uh, for for, I guess, private flights that his niece had book been booked on without him uh you know they're still defending a number of these things like the other i think he's accused of using something like 11 million dollars worth of private flights uh but he says they many of those were necessitated by security but the bottom line argument is that some bad things did happen however we we've, we've reformed internally ourselves and there's been restitution made no further action is needed you, that appears to be their argument. What do you make of that? Well, it's a rather hollow argument because all throughout this, uh, they have been fighting the attorney general and many of the uh, directors who uh, were really upset what, about what went on have been kicked off the board, uh, including some who were close allies of LaPierre. I mean, he was basically uh, acting like uh, Stalin or some other dictator. Uh, anybody who opposed him was just kicked out uh, off the board. And in terms of the corrections, uh, there were some, he, he hasn't paid back. He paid some federal uh, penalties under Section 4958 of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, several thousand dollars. Um, in terms of state repayments um, to the NRA, it's nowhere near uh, what he took. Um, so it, it really, they haven't reformed themselves. And they've, uh, that's one of the reasons why this case is, is still going on. And uh, LaPierre has since resigned. Right. It's uh, right. And, and, and as part of that, uh, the, the, sort of the next level of defense that I've seen from uh, at least the NRA's lawyers uh, in particular, the, the Brewer firm representing the NRA, they've argued that insofar as the attorney general has shown harm, that the harm is actually done to the NRA because these uh, individual defendants, including LaPierre, were taking money from the NRA. They weren't enriching the NRA by doing this stuff as an organization. Um, and most of them are not involved with the NRA anymore, including now 
Queen LaPierre having resigned, you know, it, really in the middle of the trial because he announced it on the eve of it, but it didn't go into effect until the end of January, which was right in the middle of the trial. Yeah. What, you know, is that a stronger case? Uh, I think not, not at all, because one of the things that is going on with the NRA is that they have uh, lost uh, several million members. It's a membership in terms of its finances. It's driven by membership dues. And it has lost 40% of its financing. So it's no longer in fear of going bankrupt, literally going bankrupt. But the services it provides um, are greatly reduced. And that has really harmed the organization. And that's why it's uncertain if it's going to be able to recover. I mean, I can give you some figures I, I found from... Uh, an article about this by an accountant. Um, their spending for educational policy uh, was uh, $7.7 million in 2016, was reduced to $3.2 million in 2022, the last fiscal year that they have uh, records. Uh, law enforcement support from $7.2 million to $5.1 million. Field services, 11.9 million to 1.3 million. Spending on programming from 176 million in 2017 uh, to 73 million in 2022. Um, also, uh, their legal expenses uh, have averaged $40 million a year for the last three years, totaling over $100 million. So uh, the situation of the NRA has been really going down the tubes. And um, that's been going on since the time that the suit was brought. And, and in terms of the full payback, that's just not so. Okay. So, and, and you think that that is, is further evidence of how the NRA was harmed in this scheme? Is that, what you're, is that the argument? Absolutely. Okay. Well, not to speak of its reputation, when you lose 2 million members, uh, 2 million people are disgusted with the way this organization has been run. And as I said, it almost had to declare bankruptcy. Apparently it doesn't now, but it really has very little uh, free assets, in other words, to, um, you know, like extra funds sure yeah no their their finances have have certainly dwindled uh over the course yeah, of this just, i'm just wondering if that has uh like obviously that has a so that's sort of a real world practical impact but is that going to play a role in this court case uh, as far as uh, you know what the jury considers or the judge considers when it comes to you know whether or not the nra has reformed itself or, or i i think it certainly will okay uh because so many of the things he did was without the permission of the board. I mean, he did it on his own. And the amount of money that he's paid back, he says, I've paid back $3 million or not. Paid back a million dollars. 300,000. Well, they've lost somewhere around a million members, maybe more than that at this point. Yeah. But yeah. Well, whatever it is, uh, that's a definite harm, which um, they're probably not going to recover a lot of them. So, uh, I think that's all part of the part of the problem. But if he's not there anymore, right? If he's gone, uh, does like uh, you know? It, it seems like his uh, people who were uh, allies of his inside the organization are now are still in charge. Uh, but he's gone. Maybe you don't think that'll have uh, a, a practical uh, effect for this case. Yeah, you know, what I would guess is going to happen is that the attorney general is going to ask for a monitor. Uh -huh. of the organization. Uh, and the attorney general doesn't want to destroy the NRA. She wants to reform it. <clears throat> and what will happen well, we'll get that into that in a minute, is but yeah. the monitor will look at the controls, uh, look at the board, bring new people on the board, uh, then give a kosher or halal seal of approval to the organization. Uh, <clears throat> the attorney general will release the monitor 
uh, the NRA will leave New York and go to Texas. And that's <clears throat> and the organization will be in good shape. What usually happens when the attorney general brings an action against a nonprofit, the nonprofit will run to the courthouse to say that we will reform ourselves. What do you want us to do? LaPierre didn't do that. Uh, <clears throat> he wanted to fight, and he's going to lose the fight. And the fact that he resigned, you know, it's sort of like somebody robs a bank and then says, well, oh, you caught me? I'll give the money back. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm free. I didn't do anything. Um, so anyway, that's the way I think it's going to turn out, is that James is going to <clears throat> make sure that the organization is on the up and up. And if the NRA wants to go to Texas, they will be able to dissolve the New York branch or the headquarters in New York and reincorporate in Texas. Okay. Well, speaking of James, uh, I think the, it's a good time to bring up the NRAs, what they would like their main defense to be in this case, um, which is the political aspect of this, right? You know, you mentioned the politics of the NRA at the beginning of the show, but uh, you know, obviously uh, a lot of people dislike how the NRA operates and um, its political uh, activities, but many, many people like it too. It drew a lot of people to the organization um, as well. And, and, um, you know, their their argument throughout this has been that Letitia James is politically motivated. You know, she and to be fair, she did say on the campaign trail that that she wanted to investigate the NRA because she believed that it was uh, uh, a corrupting force for the country. She I believe, she literally said it was a terrorist organization. Um, and so uh, and then she did try to dissolve the organization as part of this action. She wanted to. Uh, shut it down, essentially. And so, uh, you know, the NRA has tried to raise that as a defense in the case, but that was um, rejected by this, been, by the judge and an appeals yeah, it court. Been, it's been rejected. Why, why was that? Yeah, Can you explain every, that for, for listeners? Yeah, uh, the reason it was rejected was that there was no causal connection between what she said when she was running for office and harm to the NRA in terms of this lawsuit. Um, she's not, you know, if she has a First Amendment right to say what she wants when she's running for office, um, but the courts have said there is absolutely no indication that what she said has harmed the NRA in terms of this lawsuit. And every judge has reached that conclusion. And the NRA keeps bringing it up again. It's a loser. Yeah. And court, uh, that's right. why it's been ignored. Yes. Because I think it has no impact. Hmm. You, know, you have a judge who's, who's making a decision or a jury, mm -hmm. not what the uh, uh, attorney general is saying or claiming. Um, <clears throat> she lost on dissolving the organization. Right. Because one reason it was not ripe, because they hadn't really made the uh, appropriate conclusions that were accepted by the court that it deserved to be dissolved. Right. And the, I, the court found really it would have been think, harmful to the members who are supposed to be yeah. the people that the AG is is stewing in the interest of. I mean, they, that's where, yeah. you know, obviously her public comments uh, would uh, seem to conflict with her. The, the stated goal of, of her role in this case, which is to protect NRA members. If she's saying that they're de, de, de a terrorist organization, like it's you know, like, at least from the public eye, that looks really bad. Don't you, don't you think, but I guess. It well, it may, may look bad or? politically. Yeah. You know, it legally, uh, the courts have said it, it means nothing. She was uh, running for office um, and said all sorts of things. But it doesn't really impact uh, on the case because you have uh, judges or juries um, and uh, <clears throat> she has uh, <clears throat> proven uh, not. And the fact that the terrorist thing is is really ridiculous. And I don't think she should have said it. But politicians, when they're running for office, uh, say a lot of things that they shouldn't say. 
Um, and it, it really hasn't hurt the NRA. And where it is, what has hurt is when the sorts of things she's uncovered of abuse uh, has hurt the organization because members have said, what am I giving my money to this organization so this guy can, uh, you know, uh, send his family on uh, private jets to go on vacation? Um, and I think that's what's hurt them when it's come out what the people who run the organization have done and when LaPierre has gotten rid of many of those people. And also the legal expenses have been outrageously high. Um, and um, some of the lawyers have been friends of LaPierre. Sure. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I guess to, to crystallize this, her comments made on the campaign trail don't matter in this court case because she has evidence of actual wrongdoing that aren't related to uh, whatever political opinion she holds of the group, right? Is that essentially what's going on? Yeah, I, I think so. And, uh, you know, there's uh, legal action going on now against a former president who's claiming that uh, <clears throat> the people are all biased against him, they're racist or whatever. Uh, and that's that's going to be irrelevant. It, it really is. Uh, it's going to be the facts and were facts you know, was the law violated? Hmm. Uh, and it's the same thing with the NRA. And in fact, LaPierre has said that he was wrong. Right. Yeah, at least on a limited basis, right? I, mean, I guess their whole thing is... Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, he admits wrongdoing to a degree, and the NRA admits he did wrong to a degree, but not to the same degree that the AG is accusing him. And I guess that's yeah. what's left for the judge and jury to decide here, right? Who, who's telling that's the truth correct. at that point? Okay. Yeah. And, and and also, uh, LaPierre may face uh, criminal indictments under state law. Uh, I'm not sure that that's over with. Hmm. For tax evasion? I mean, or, he's, or he, for what? Yeah, for uh, stealing funds, misappropriation of funds that uh, belong to the organization. In your, I mean, it was a piggy bank. Right. In your experience, how often do civil tr cases like this one uh, translate into criminal charges after you know if not not very frequently and the reason is most individuals do not want to get on the wrong side of the attorney general and rush to try and settle another thing that happens often is that when the attorney general or other legal officials go after an organization it's very hard to recover that reputation or the mojo that the organization had. You think of uh, Susan Coleman, the race for the cure. Uh, they had some problems. They, they really haven't just been what they were. And that's one of the problems the NRA has, <clears throat> that they've been very, very hurt. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, so uh, I, I want to be respectful of your time here, so I know we don't have a lot left. So let's get back to your your thoughts on where this is headed. I, I want to get to the the monitor or the court appointed overseer at the end, but first, can you walk through what these individual plaintiffs? Where do you see this going? I mean, I, there's been a request for a directed verdict from the NRA and these individual uh, plaintiffs, uh, like like the general counsel John Frazier trying to dispute whether he even falls under this law she's trying to uh, use against him. Where do you see uh, that the individual defendants' cases ending up? What punishments? Are I think it really there? will depend on the facts. Uh, some who really did try to, who, they did not know uh, what was going on, and they tried. To, to stop things and were unsuccessful. Uh, they were kicked off the board. Uh, others are going to be found responsible. It really depends on the facts uh, because there were a number of board members who uh, were in the black about this and uh, did try and do what was right. Uh, and that, you know, it, as I say, some I'm sure are not uh, going to get off and others will. 
Uh, so what about Wayne LaPierre himself? How do you see the outcome for him? It's it's really hard to say. Uh, you know, he's has a doctor saying that he's uh, really maybe suffering from dementia. Um, and he has uh, long-term Lyme disease. Uh, I'm less sympathetic to the long-term Lyme disease uh, excuse than I am to, uh, you know, the dementia uh, issue, if that's so. Um, but I think he could face other um, actions. Do you not, he'll be forced to pay back that that problem, early, but, uh, more than when he's already paid? Yeah, you know, it could possibly be criminal, hmm. you know, a criminal action, uh, an attempt to get back more money. Those things could could happen. OK, and then for as, as for the organization itself, the NRA, um, you know, you mentioned the possibility of a, a monitor. You seem to think that's a likely outcome in this case. Right. Uh, what else could could happen with them? Well, I think. Uh, the the monitor will be a short term thing, and the good people in the NRA, meaning the honest people who want to make the organization a strong organization again, uh, will welcome the monitor, uh, because when the monitor says they're they're doing what they're supposed to do, they've introduced the governance reforms that they should have had, uh, then the monitor will <clears throat> be excused. And the organization will uh, probably revive to some extent. I mean, uh, and it might be a good idea for the organization not to try and be at the lead of, uh, you know, one party, such, you know, to try and be more nonpartisan and to do the, the gun control, uh, so not gun control, but in terms of gun safety and things of that sort. Um, yeah, well, this I guess that's one of the sort of risks with a monitor that I foresee is, is you know, they're supposed to be there to ensure that the, the organization is, uh, you know, running within the rules of, of New York law as far as how they expend their money or the oversight that they have. But they're, you know, they're, this is a very politically charged case. I mean, like, like yeah, and the monitor there. can't get involved, will not get involved in that. Okay. Uh, and uh, that that damage has been done, but uh, it would seem to me that if you're trying to rebuild the NRA, maybe you don't want to be on the edge of uh, <clears throat> pushing uh, anything goes with uh, guns. I mean, we have uh, 26 states which have concealed carry rules. Which means in some of these states, a student can bring a pistol to class, but can't read certain books uh, because the books are banned. That's crazy. Well, um, I, yeah, again, I think a lot of people would dispute one way or the other. But the point of the the point of all of this is this is where, you know, people get worried about these kinds of things or because the point of it is supposed to be that the organization is properly functioning, not the AG or, or other government officials putting their view of yeah, what the AG will, should will, advocate for. Right? Yeah. The, when the case is over and everything is determined and the monitor uh, does his work, um, the organization is on its own. As I say, it'll go to Texas, and how, how which long will be have, more hospitable. In other, in other circumstances where you've seen monitors appointed, how long do they tend to, to serve for? I mean, uh, I guess the team It can be a year. A year? Okay, go ahead. It can be a year, uh, maybe longer, depending on the organization. Uh, unions have had <clears throat> very uh, some long monitorships mm -hmm. because they're they're big organizations complex organizations uh the nra is not you know it's not in that category um but i would assume that they want to get their house in order yeah <clears throat> and when they do uh the case will be over does and the, the monitor will does a monitor issue a report okay uh, now would a monitor or the judge perhaps in this case uh, have the ability to restructure the organization as well, like change the the, the size yes. of the board, for instance, or things of that nature. 
Yes, certainly in terms of the board, and the board will probably be willing to do that. I mean, there there are still some people on the board who did not take, you know, they they were they were innocent themselves. They didn't know what was going on, mm. uh, and there may be new appointees, and those people will become the leaders of the organization. I would suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, good. I think we got a pretty good view of what the the possibilities are in this case. Um, and so I really appreciate you joining and and giving us. Yeah. Your, well, thank you very much for asking. Your insight me. there. Yeah. It's because uh, it's one of those things where obviously these are complex questions. Most people don't know the ins and outs of New York nonprofit law. So, yeah. Uh, I want to make sure we get somebody who does. Well, thank you, and keep keep doing your good work. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And. Uh, and yeah, maybe we'll have to have you back on the show uh, in the future if you're available to to go over any more, you know, these sort of details where we need an expert like you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Awesome, and and take care, uh, be well. Yes, yeah, so if people want to find more of your writing or, or maybe read your your book, uh, where can they do that? Uh, well, I have a lot of a number of articles in law reviews. Uh, most of them, you probably have to go to a law library. You know, I've written some books that probably have sold 10 copies, but how many can your mother buy? <laughs> well, that's yeah. common in academia, right? But, uh, but I'm yeah, sure, right. you know, if people look up your name in uh, a scholarly, uh, in, in a law library, they will probably be able to find your work, right? Yeah, there are a lot of law review articles and there's a lot written about the nonprofit world. Yes. And of course, you've, which you've been featured. Not, in, not in legal jargon. <laughs> you've been featured, of course, in a lot of. Uh, news articles as well discussing this case. So uh, that, that's uh, another place people can find uh, find what you've had to say. So, all right, well, great. We're going to head on over to our uh, news update now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined as always by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. How are we doing this week, Steve? I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I feel like I'm almost over my cold. I still have it a little bit. It's actually just like lingering a little bit. It's very annoying. But uh, certainly better than it was. I oh, say so you do sa you do sound better than last week. That's for sure. So at least you're on the the upswing. Yeah, I'm that's doing pretty good, good too. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like actually I'm coming down possibly with something. I woke up a little congested this morning, but so uh, hopefully it's not just one one person to the to the next having a cold. Yeah, but. hopefully it didn't transmit over the internet from Virginia to Colorado <laughs> here. But yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you'll uh, you won't have to suffer through it as long as I did. It's been yeah, I never got super sick, but it was just like just annoying enough. Sick. Yeah. yeah. So, oh well. But um, yeah, what do we got in terms of news this week? Sure. So, uh, onto the newsletter links, uh, we got one from Reuters actually about California's ammunition background check law. We covered the fact that it was blocked or actually struck down by Judge Benitez in district court. But now a three-judge panel, a motions panel of the Ninth Circuit, has allowed that law to go back into effect while the appeals process plays out. So background checks for ammunition sales are the law of the land again in California. Yeah, which is to be expected, I think. Uh, that's yeah. how this, these things usually go, uh, especially in the Ninth Circuit. You tend to get stays on these appeals. So um, we'll keep watching that case, though, for what the next step is and as far as the hearings on the merits. Certainly. Uh, and then the next story we're going to talk about comes to from the Richmond Times Dispatch. And it's actually a little bit outdated, actually, since I put this in the uh, in the newsletter. But uh, it's about Virginia and the fact that both now both the House and the Senate have passed an assault weapon ban bill, uh, which is pretty remarkable to see in a state that until recently was fairly divided in control uh, over the last couple of years. They just the Virginia Democrats wasted no time with their narrow majorities in both chambers of the legislature. And they've officially passed a gun ban bill. Yeah, although it is still, of course, divided here. We have the governor is, is Glenn Youngkin, who's a Republican, and uh, we don't know yet what he's going to do. I think it's likely he'll veto this bill. Yeah. Um, well, we will have to follow up with him, I think, for a story. Because one of the interesting things about all this, actually, is, uh, of course, they passed the assault weapons ban, which they weren't able to do in 2020 when they had full control of the state government here in Virginia when Democrats had that uh, before Youngkin was was elected. Um, and uh, so this time around, maybe it's a little bit easier to get these kind of votes through when you don't, when they're perhaps not going to become law, right? You won't suffer the consequences necessarily of having that enacted. 
But it, one of the fascinating things to see is that they're, they're really doing this on pure party line basis where they need every, essentially every Democrat on board, which they've gotten. And they seem like they're going to send something like 20 plus bills to Yunkin's desk that are new gun restrictions, essentially. And um, so that's fairly remarkable, especially in a purpley state like Virginia, uh, that Democrats have the, the party has really aligned to go as far left on the issue as as you can imagine. I mean, these are uh, this isn't universal background checks or something like that. I mean, we already have that in Virginia, but um, <clears throat> you know, they're they're the entire party is comfortable pushing the limits of of the gun policy debate, which is somewhat fascinating. And you're really not seeing any crossover support from Republicans either. I think there's one Republican who's voted for a couple of these bills, not the more not the bans, but uh, some of the other provisions. Uh, and that's about it. So it's a pretty fascinating scene here in Virginia. I, I think it encapsulates what's going on throughout the entire country at this point, where the parties have become completely aligned on these issues. And there really aren't a lot of people that aren't too completely to one side or the other at this point. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point, right? We don't know yet how many of these that is. Right. How many of these bills will actually make it into law, but the fact that the politicians in the legislature that are passing these are so deadlocked and and set on these policies, it's a notable political development. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um especially it's only been, you know, in 2020 there was a huge protest over the uh the gun control bills that they were considering. Um it was one of the largest grassroots protests. Uh, of of gun policies that I think the country has ever seen, and so uh, only a couple of years later, the Democratic Party has been not was not moved at all by that. Uh, so pretty fascinating. And then get to the final link that we're going to talk about today it comes to the to us from the Wall Street Journal, and it's dealing with the major decision in the criminal trial in Michigan. Uh, the Crumbly mother, Jennifer Crumbly, was found guilty of manslaughter. Uh, so that's a pretty substantial development where a mother was given criminal liability for her son's uh, decision to enact or engage in a school shooting. Um, and I know you've been covering this story both on CNN and you wrote an analysis piece for us here at The Reload about what this all means. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a landmark thing. It's first of its kind decision. And uh, yeah, I've done a couple of interviews on CNN talking about this. And then, yeah, the, wrote that analysis piece trying to work through what this is going to mean. Now, you know, it could go a number of different ways, right? It, maybe it's just this particularly unique set of circumstances in the Crumley case, uh, especially because, well, one, the parents bought the gun for him. Now, they didn't, according to Jennifer Crumley, it wasn't just given to him. He They, they kept it separate from him. He was only supposed to use it at the range, but obviously he got a hold of it, so we're, it's not really clear how, or at least it wasn't from the trial. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but somehow he got a hold of the gun. And so whatever they were doing to secure it wasn't enough, obviously. Um, and then additionally, there was, of course, uh, the, the meeting, the day of the shooting, right before the shooting happened, uh, the Crumbleys were called in because the, their son had drawn a number of pictures and wrote, uh, some very disturbing messages about blood everywhere and, and please, you know, uh, make, make, make it stop you know, the, the stuff that indicated he was a threat to himself or others. And the school noticed this called the parents in and then nobody, they, they all proceeded to do nothing. They sent him back to class. The parents didn't want to take him out of school for, to seek immediate help because they didn't want to miss work. And the school apparently didn't deem him enough of a threat to force them to do that. So huge, Huge mistake because he had the gun in his back and nobody searched him at this point. And the parents didn't go back and make sure that the guns were secure. So a lot of really bad choices that led to uh, him murdering four of his classmates. But uh, but it's you know, it wasn't something where the parents were actively involved in the planning, the shooting or had advanced knowledge of it or helped carry it out or anything like that. This is purely from a negligence standpoint that they the argument was that they she wasn't. Uh, responsible enough with her son, didn't fo didn't follow through on warning signs that he was having mental health issues, didn't secure the gun well enough, didn't 
take threats seriously, ignored her son and way, you know, so the, she didn't make for a very co compelling witness or a very sympathetic defendant. Um, she said she wouldn't have done things differently, which is a bizarre thing to say after your son murders four people. But, um, but still, you know, is it just this set of circumstances, just this set of facts that could lead to the, this kind of ruling or are we now going to see this broadly applied to all kinds of situations where the a parent is held responsible for their child's <clears throat> violent actions, if uh, you know, especially if their one of their guns was involved. Uh, and so that's what I worked through in the piece. I, I don't know; it could have very, really broad implications. And I think what we're likely to find out is um, how we're going to find that out is through more of these sorts of charges. I, I think that's going to be the big outcome. Well, I think the first thing we'll wait and see what happens with the husband. He was charged separately. Right. James Crumley. She kind of tried to blame him, said he was the one responsible for securing the gun and she didn't view it as her responsibility, which is not a good point of view, but also probably not a super uncommon one. I would imagine in a lot of households, uh, unfortunately, it shouldn't be that way, but I don't think it's rare for uh, one one parent to view the other parent as the one responsible for, for gun safety. Um, it shouldn't shouldn't be that way, but I don't think it's uncommon. And, um, you know, how James Crumbly's case comes out might give us more indication of whether this is going to be a, a larger trend or if it's just because of the specific circumstances of this particular case. Yeah. No, yeah, it definitely, you know, could signal big things. There's certainly an appetite. You see it all the time, at least among the general public. There's certainly an appetite for this kind of thing when people are understandably distraught about, you know, violent, horrific crimes, mass shootings, that sort of thing. But on the other yeah. hand, you have, you know, criminal justice reform types that say, you know, this could be opening a very troubling can of worms that could extend beyond just mass shootings to just your typical street crimes where, you know, oh, hardworking sure. pa parents get caught in the criminal justice system because their children are off committing crimes. So it's and the other thing too is issue. like securing your guns um, is obviously extremely important. It's your responsibility as, as a parent. And, you know, you could become liable if you don't do that properly, but there's a big difference between securing your gun from a curious small child and securing your gun from a determined teenager. You know, that, that's something else that like, um, <clears throat> that, that people need to understand. I mean, the, Jennifer Crumley claimed that they locked up their guns. Now she also seemed to indicate that maybe he, the son knew where the key was. And, you know, obviously that would not be a very good situation if that was how that turned out. Uh, he got the gun, but, um, uh, you know, and that's another thing. Like she, we don't even know really how he got the gun, uh, at least not from the his testimony. So, they kind of held her responsible regardless of how they were storing it. And, um, and yeah, you know, so where's that line, right? And same thing for mental health, uh, help. Where's the line there? Like they, they, this is a big theme of the case against her, right? That she ignored some of these warning signs that his mental health was deteriorating, uh, or didn't do enough to help him. Um, and yeah, where's that line too? Like, are you, are parents responsible if they don't get the right kind of treatment at the right moment? Or you know, where's the where do you come down on the spectrum of cases is is what I think this this verdict opens up conversation for. Like where where are these lines? And again, I think it's probably going to be determined more by future cases on this front. I think the effect of this mainly is going to be that prosecutors are going to be emboldened to bring these kind of charges against all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances. So I don't know, we'll, we'll see, but it's uh, it's certainly uh, something people should be aware of and, and the potential implications of it are huge. Absolutely. Yeah. It raises a lot of questions and we will, obviously we'll try to stay on top of it to see how it develops across the country. Um, and as we get into some of the stories we wrote this week, uh, you had a, a, an interesting story about a ruling out of the Hawaii Supreme court that essentially ruled that Heller and Bruin and basically all of the current modern Second Amendment jurisprudence is incorrect, at least as it applies to Hawaii and it's invalid, and that the spirit of aloha is the per persuasive authority for <laughs> for gun laws and being able to carry a gun. So if you want to tell us a little bit more about that ruling. Yeah, this is a pretty 
remarkable opinion written by the Hawaii Supreme Court. Uh, now, this is technically based on a state law case. Uh, there was a man who was charged for carrying without a permit on uh, property there, and uh, he, char he, he challenged his charges on constitutional grounds. Uh, and this case was specifically decided on the Hawaiian Constitution. Of course, the thing is about the Hawaiian Constitution is they have a gun rights provision that is literally identical to the Second Amendment. It's the exact same words as the Second Amendment. So the Hawaiian Supreme Court's interpretation of the Hawaii Second Amendment is going to be inseparable from uh, their interpretation of the federal Second Amendment. Um, but yeah, they essentially completely rejected the Supreme Court's Jewish jurisprudence on this front. Uh, and and just said that the, this this language does not provide a an individual it doesn't protect an individual right to keep or carry guns that in Hawaii there's just no there aren't gun rights and they pointed back to uh, pre-American Hawaiian history and and the spirit of aloha and uh, some of the uh, weapons restrictions that existed in the kingdom of Hawaii before it was a state. Um, and yeah, it essentially rejected, which is a little bit odd because they mainly uh, rejected Bruin and its test based on the idea that looking to the founding era was too old or it was wrong to look that far back, but they're using um you know the hawaiian history that stretches back several hundred years as well so it's a bit strange um some of the stuff that they wrote but uh, you know bottom line is they essentially rejected the prevailing standard of what the second amendment does and what what it protects uh they they used uh, you know the uh, an argument that i think is common on the left in media, but not very common anymore in court, which is that the Second Amendment or this language effectively protects uh, some sort of collective right um, and effectively does nothing. But to be frank, like that's just kind of the bottom line of this interpretation that the sec this language means, means basically nothing. Um, <clears throat> and so... Yeah, I think it sets up a potential showdown with the Supreme Court. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward rebuke of everything they've said about gun rights in America. And it does additionally uh, extend this to the Second Amendment, even though the case is primarily about Hawaii's constitution, uh, whatever distinction you can draw there, because, the, again, the Hawaiian gun rights provision is identical to the Second Amendment anyway, but but they do also reject this uh, man's claim of Second Amendment protections under the federal constitution. So uh, <clears throat> it, it reminds me a lot of the Massachusetts case, Saitano, which the court took in 2016 uh, and issued a just a short two-page rebuke of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. They had ruled essentially that stun guns were not protected by the Second Amendment because the Second Amendment only protects um, weapons that were available at the time of the founding. And that was also something that went directly against what was what the court held in, in Heller. So you got a 9-0 unanimous rebuke of this case from the Supreme Court in 2016 um, without really any, without having to go through a lot of um, legal writing to explain why. And so this seems like a candidate perhaps for that. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty remarkable ruling, really, I'd say that. Like yeah, it's, you don't usually see this sort of straightforward, complete rejection of Supreme Court precedent, um, just saying that it's completely wrong and they're not going to abide by it and they're just gonna make up their own, which includes of course, an appeal to the spirit of Allahu, which I don't I don't know that the court the Supreme Court is going to find that persuasive. <laughs> right. well, yeah, no, that was maybe we'll my, 
my first thought as well is just, this is one of the most remarkable rulings I've seen. And, you know, we cover a lot of gun, gun rulings. Spirit of and, Aloha, I think I said. Yeah. I apologize no to our Hawaiian uh, listeners. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Usually, because the thing about it is like, usually you see some sort of reasoning to try and abide by the court's, at least uh, right. the text of what they've said. That's where you're getting a lot of these broom response bills that we've talked so much about. They don't just say, we don't care. We're just going to keep our, our our old permitting system in place. They find some other way to get to the same basic effect or maybe even more severe effect in some cases like California. But they don't just say, we completely reject the Supreme Court's ruling here they try to get around in some other way uh, and usually courts courts that uphold those kind of laws will uh do the same thing they'll they'll they'll, they'll try to logic their way into how this is justifiable under the supreme court standard they don't just say they might they might make comments about how they don't like the, where the supreme court is at that, that's pretty common right from, right from lower courts but you don't usually see them just straightforwardly toss it all out wholesale and claim it's wrong. So they're not going to follow it. That's, that's a pretty unique and rare, rare thing to see. Right. We'll have to see what, what happens with this. Uh, you know, it's made a lot of news, not just with the reload. So we'll see what, where it goes, but. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems like something that the court would be, would be an easy thing for them to take up, but it, it is a, again, technically a state case law or state law right. case. Um, so that maybe there's some complication in moving it from state court to federal court uh, that that's uh, beyond my uh, comprehension at the moment. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't be a candidate for Supreme Court review, but there is some chance that uh, it doesn't make it there. And, and frankly, Hawaii is not a hotbed of gun rights activism. Um, there's really kind of, we've interviewed him on the show several times. There's really kind of one gun rights lawyer who operates there, Alan Beck, and maybe he will uh, take up this, this case to get it to uh, the, this into the federal court system. Um, but we'll have to follow it and see what happens. Absolutely. But uh, speaking of candidates for Supreme court review, we have a story about the Biden administration going to the Supreme Court and asking them to uh, take up the case over the ATF's frames and receivers rule. Um, mm. It's interesting. Yeah, to that see was your that was your piece. What what exactly are you, is going on there? Yeah, so this has been sort of a fascinating ping pong of a case because you've had this get struck down a couple times, limited rulings, but struck down a couple times, at least enjoined on a preliminary injunction basis at the district court level, and then it would go up to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, well, first of all, they would get emergency relief from the Supreme Court, the DOJ would. And so they would say, well, we'll stay at pending appeal. And then it would go up to the Fifth Circuit. And then a couple of times at the Fifth Circuit, it was <laughs> blocked. Um, and then they get twice, they got emergency relief again from the Supreme Court that said, okay, we're going to stay at pending appeal. And then the Fifth Circuit said, well, this is flat out on the merits, uh, uh, overreach of agency power. And we vacate, um, we vacate the rule, essentially. Um, but because of the terms of the Supreme Court's emergency stay, it said, whatever happens, it's it stayed pending a writ of certiorari, which is the application essentially for the Supreme Court to hear a case, uh, pending the outcome of what we decide whether or not to take a case, it stayed no matter what. So even though the Fifth Circuit said that this is an invalid exercise of agency power, this particular rule, it's it's still in effect. And so now you have the Biden administration saying, Supreme Court, please step in and clarify once and for all that they're obviously arguing that the rule is good because it's, you know, it's their rule. Um, but I think it's setting up a, a very likely Supreme Court showdown, at least in maybe a limited regard. But I think just because of that, the terms of those that uh, emergency stay, it seems like the Supreme Court one way or another has to weigh in here. Yeah. And the Supreme Court usually takes up cases like this when the Solicitor General you know, essentially the right. DOJ, the, the current administration asked them to take up cases like this. So, you know, they've already granted that review in the bump stock ban case, which is very similar to this case. Right. Um, and, and so I wouldn't be surprised if they take this or if they like decide the bump stock ban case and then GBR this case uh, or, or something along those lines. 
where the the outcome of the bump stock being case, or maybe they combine it with the bump stock being case. I, I don't. Right. I don't, we don't know exactly what they're going to do, but I think this case is so closely related to uh, that other case that it's very likely the Supreme Court is going to have some decision on it. Whether or not they take it as an individual case, I, I guess is uh, another question. But right, um, I, I just don't see them doing nothing with it because if they decide we're not going to, we're just going to deny cert, then that just creates a big hole in the rule in the Fifth Circuit, and I, I don't think that's a status quo that the Supreme Court's willing to. Well, mm -hmm. this rule is invalid in in these couple of states, you know, Texas and Louisiana, but it's valid everywhere else. I just don't don't know if I see the justices saying that that's a tenable status quo. Yeah, you're probably right, but I and I think that's where how they address it is another question whether it's right. as an individual case or part of a larger larger litigation on the basic question about these atf rulemaking uh schemes so uh you know we'll, we'll see where it goes uh obviously the court has had appetite to intervene here but i do, i also think like that doesn't really give you insight into what they think on the merits right right um you know, maybe maybe it does because the first stay application was would have been rejected by four of the conservative justices, right? Then uh, it was granted. Then presumably, if you just do the math, because Barrett and Rod, uh, Roberts sided with the liberals on the court to grant the stay. Now, <clears throat> is that going to translate to a five-four? ruling upholding the rule on the merits I, i'd be very surprised if it did especially because this isn't actually a second amendment case you know as we've talked about before with the these atf rules whether it's the bump stock ban or the this ghost gun ban um <clears throat> these are administrative powers cases so the court has been perhaps even more skeptical of administrative power than they have of gun restrictions of the you know its most recent terms so It'd be very surprising to me if they upheld either of these rules, but it's not a foredrawn conclusion. We'll, we'll have to right. wait and see exactly how it comes out. Right. No, that's a good point. Um, and then finally, I think we're going to talk about what you're going to be up to today. I think just after we finish recording this, you'll be heading up to Pennsylvania to go to the NRA outdoor show to see candidate and former president Trump speak uh, and tell us a little bit about the sort of political dynamics at the NRA right now. Yeah, so we're we're filming this on Friday, so uh, right before Friday morning. So I'm headed up to the outdoor show. I've got credentials to watch the speech. I think this will be. I would be very surprised if they didn't endorse Trump in, in this event. It'd be kind of weird, actually, if they didn't do it because they've set it up to be that way. Uh, you know, they announced this after New Hampshire, I believe, if I remember correctly. So Trump had already won. Iowa and New Hampshire. And while Nikki Haley is, you know, former South Carolina governor is still in the race. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people in the Republican party view this as pretty much over. Um, you know, it is out of the ordinary for the NRA to go and make an endorsement this early. Like they haven't done that ever. So, um, you know, it just sort of reinforce, reinforces how tied they are to Donald Trump and how tied they've been to him over the last eight years. Um, you know, they were the main outside group, the, the, one of the only major outside groups to spend big on his behalf in 2020 or sorry, 2016. Um, and so I think he's, uh, understands how much perhaps he, or at least he, he sure seems to think he wants to, he needs to appeal to NRA members. He's done that consistently over the years, even though there's a lot of sort of policy issues where maybe he hasn't always been a hundred percent with the NRA um, or, or maybe, you know, like the bump stock ban, they were sort of on the same page, but maybe not, but obviously other gun rights advocates are not happy with the bump stock. Ban. I mean, that's why it's declared unconstitutional and is at the Supreme court right now uh, because other activists have filed, filed suit in, against that rule that uh, Trump put in place. But, and, you know, he's flirted with gun control, policies when he when he was president um but he never went through with um with them so he's kind of always reverted back to the nra and he spoke at the nra's annual meeting every year but this event is uh, unusual because they don't normally have any sort of political aspect to the great american outdoor show it's usually just a regular gun show 
um, if you go there. I've been a couple of times. It's up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the state capital. Uh, it's at, you know, the farm show complex. So it will be an interesting place to see Trump speak, I guess. Um, you know, it's, it's where the, it's sort of like uh, where you guys have your farm show out in, in Colorado that it's much more of a like livestock facility. <laughs> like that's what it's kind of built for. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously the Great American Outdoor Show happens there every year. It's a big facility. So presumably they get a lot of uh, Trump supporters in there. We'll, we'll see what the turnout is like. But yeah, they're having, they're added this political event to this February gun show in Pennsylvania, which is an obviously a, a big key swing state in the 2024 right. election. And it'd be really weird. They, they didn't invite Nikki Haley, right, to this presidential forum. So it'd be pretty strange if they had him speak and didn't endorse him, honestly. Um, but, uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Right. Um, certainly it'll be. No, go ahead. I was just say just it's it's also interesting. One, it's sort of the like you said, it's the unusual step of endorsing this early, adding a political portion to this particular show, and it comes against this backdrop where the NRA doesn't seem like it'll have the capabilities to do much other than endorse politically this cycle. Uh, as you wrote in a, in a separate news article for us this week, they're much more financially limited in that regard than they have been in years past. So it's all sorts of kind of unusual trends for them uh, heading into this event. Yeah, there's some serious red flags that and we just published a piece on this with the NRA's political operation headed into the election and really the NRA overall. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we also had a report on uh, the trial, their corruption trial in New York is still ongoing. That ends next Friday um, and I'll be I'll be up there for that as well next week. So look for for live reports from the courtroom. Uh, during closing arguments and deliberations, and we'll see if we get a verdict next Friday or not. But um, yeah, we we actually had a new writer. I met a freelance writer while I was up covering last week the the court uh, case, and he wrote a piece for us. You know, there's some the judge is considering maybe dismissing some of these charges. Shortly, it's called a directed verdict, but you know, essentially dropping some of the charges in the case against the NRA or some of the individual defendants. And, you know, there was an interesting conversation. We got sort of firsthand uh, report on it from uh, from Joseph uh, uh, Bucker, who's hopefully going to do some more pieces for us if possible. And um, and you know, it was an interesting scene. At least I don't know if the I don't I doubt the judge is going to drop most of these things. I think they're still going to. I don't know that it's the trial is going particularly well for the NRA. I mean that you know base level they tried to avoid this trial altogether by filing for bankruptcy. So I don't, their own outlook of it was never very positive to begin with, but, um, you know, regardless, they've got, they've got to deal with that. And it's had a, you know, those corruption allegations have had a huge impact on their membership. Uh, where now we even have board members, it's kind of unclear how many members they have at this point, because you've got board members out there, current board members saying different numbers, uh, but Owen Buzz Mills said that they were under three million, which is which would be shocking. That'd be another million plus members gone. Um, he said uh, when I asked him about that claim, he he said, you know, it's according to what he's seen, it would be somewhere around three million plus or plus or minus. The NRA, an NRA spokesperson, denied that, said it was flat out false, but didn't give an estimate themselves. So I don't know what the NRA's official estimate would be at this point. And then you had another board member, Willis Lee, who tweeted that they have 3.8 million members, which would still be a huge decrease, about 400,000 from the last time we we reported that they lost a million members. So, uh, but less of a decrease than under 3 million, of course. So, you know, their their numbers are looking really bad. And membership is what drives revenue at the NRA. It just is. You know, that's that's where they get their political power and their money, primarily. And so. When you go and look at their their super PAC, their regular PAC, um, their 501c4, uh, the FEC filings available right now show they have they don't have a lot of money uh, at this point compared to where they've been in the past. They have about eleven million dollars cash on hand going into 2024. We won't get more updates on this until towards the end of February, but. What we know now is, you know, they, they, they have about $11 million for this election cycle. 
Now they can obviously raise money during this next nine months or the, you know, the, the first nine months of the year before the election happens, but they spent almost $30 million in 2020, right? So they're going to have to raise you know, almost t- twice as much money as what they have right now to match that total. And that was the election where Trump lost, right? So, uh, you know, uh, and then if you go back to 2016, where they were a huge driving force for his victory, they had they spent fifty four million dollars in that election, so they'd have to like really increase increase uh, their their fundraising. It just doesn't seem likely they're going to match either of those numbers. It's still possible, but it's they're starting from a much from a pretty deep hole to get there. Um, and, and so there's there's a lot of warning signs headed into this this election, headed into this event where they're likely to to endorse Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, what I will say, though, one interesting bit about all of this is that even as they've shrunk, you know, it's important to keep in mind the context here. They're still the largest by far of anyone in the gun rights community. There's there's really nobody else that's spending millions of dollars in 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 these elections, most likely. And, you know, a lot of the other groups have focused on other areas like legal legal work. Right. Uh, there isn't really uh, somebody coming up to replace the NRA on this front in the, the political spending. Uh, but even still, $11 million puts them actually ahead of all of the gun control groups combined. Every town, Giffords, Brady, if you look at their the same legal entities on their side that are responsible for political spending. They are just under $11 million. It's something like a, five, a half million dollar difference between their combined total and the NRA's combined total right now. And the NRA has actually, you know, they were, in 2018, there were, the, the gun control groups actually outspent the NRA. But, and I think there was a lot of thought, in, especially in media circles, that that was going to be, that was a signal of a sea change, that that was going to continue to happen from then on out. But it didn't. NRA outspent the gun control groups significantly in 2020. They outspent them again last cycle in 2022 in the midterms. And they are still ahead of them, even though they're well below where you might expect them to be at this point. They still have more money than the gun control groups. Now, it's not a lot more, and we'll have to follow it closely to see if they maintain that lead. But um, even with all the stuff going on, they've spent $100 million on legal fees over the last five years, um, and they're still keeping up with and staying ahead of the gun control group. So, you know, don't underestimate uh, the NRA or Donald Trump, right? There's a lot of reasons. Donald Trump has a lot going against him as well in, in this election, including spending. You know, he he doesn't, he's spending a lot of his own money and a lot of the Republican Party's money on his legal fees. And he's unlikely to have the ability to spend very much in this election, just like the NRA. But he's also ahead in the polls uh, against Trump. Joe Biden right now. So, you know, Trump and and the NRA certainly appear severely weakened from their high points in 2016, but they remain potent political forces, I think. Yeah. It was sort of the bottom line here. But, um, you know, we'll see what happens at this outdoor show that I'm going to head up to. But but that's where I'm at for the moment. Uh, Anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up soon here because I got to get on the road to go up to, to Pennsylvania and see my alma mater. This is right by Messiah College. Um, that's where I went to to school, although now it's been upgraded to Messiah University. So I don't I don't know if my diploma is worth more now or not, but <laughs> um, that's right by uh, where where the speech is happening. And so I'm going to Round Top, which is not Gettysburg. Little Round Top, but Round Top Ski Resort, which is near the, my my college uh, for my birthday, which is on Saturday. Um, so hopefully I have a good time, although I think it's actually going to be in the like 50s. So not ideal snowboarding right. conditions. Maybe we'll just do some snow tubing. I don't know. But uh, I'm looking forward to that part of the trip, the, uh, the whole speech convention aspect. I've done quite a lot of times before, um, so I'm not as excited although i do want to speak to some more nra members in person last time i was up at the great american outdoor show i interviewed a bunch of them uh try to get some what the average person who attends the show is thinking and um 
yeah, we'll maybe hopefully I'll be able to do that again this time around. It's always good to connect. You know, we have plenty of NRA members that voice their opinion in, in the comment section on the reload and and elsewhere. But it, it's also good to go and talk to people in person. Yeah, see what they're, absolutely they're thinking. What about you? You got anything coming up here this weekend? Anything fun? Other than football, uh, mm, yeah, watching the big watching the big game on Sunday. Yeah, I, I probably you, have to work. Picking? I go back and forth, right? Uh, I I think the Niners have a lot of the weapons to to do it, but I, it's just hard to root against. The, the Chiefs always seem to find a way, even in I don't think they're as good as they've been in years past. And it's it's much to my as an AFC West fan of obviously the Broncos, yeah. it just pains me to to say that the Chiefs are going to win. But I think there's a good shot that they find a Who way. Who are you rooting for, though? Are you rooting for them? Niners, because Christian McCaffrey is uh, actually is from my hometown. I remember watching him oh. torch my high school's football team every every year. So nice. Uh, and obviously, his father was a Denver Broncos legend. Ed McCaffrey is great wide receiver for us for many years. So I think because mm. of that tie, I'd root for the Niners. Um, yeah, I'm picking the Chiefs. I, I like. I, I'm rooting for the Chiefs. I, you know, Jason Kelsey's brother plays on that team, from what I've heard. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, so I like that, and I just don't like the Niners as an Eagles yeah. fan, especially they just ugh, after the last couple of years of them. Uh, and you know, I don't dislike Mahomes and the whole dynasty thing. Maybe, I'm sure it will get very old if they keep doing this, right? Uh, just like the Patriots. But at this point, I don't know. I wouldn't mind seeing them win. I say we're in the reverse situation. You're sick of the Niners as an Eagles fan, and I'm (laughs) sick of the Chiefs as a Broncos fan. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. Obviously, the Chiefs beat us in the last Super Bowl, so I don't, I don't know. Can't have too much affinity for them, but it's true. But uh, I still, I still mainly blame the field for that. The the sod father guy. What they made a field was such a mess. Yeah, nobody could get any pressure. Just awful. Anyway, it's all in the past now. should be fun game to watch. Yeah, I would. I would imagine they're obviously Absolutely. very two, two very talented teams. So we'll see what what comes of it all. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's hard. To, it's also really hard to ever bet against Patrick Mahomes. Right, that's kind of just, where I'm at. <laughs> he's, he's just too talented. It's ridiculous. Right. Um, I don't know. It's something about these ultra talented quarterbacks where, like, this you've seen the whole thing about his dad bod or whatever. Yeah, um, you know they. If you want to be uh, the most elite quarterback in history, you have to be like a, a fairly unremarkable physical specimen is what it seems right. like. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe maybe someday we, you know, I can make it up there. Uh, if, if Brady <laughs> yeah. and Mahomes are the guide for physical fitness at the elite quarterback position, yeah. tell Jalen like Hurts makes to it stop a little squatting. more attainable for the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, tell tell Jalen Hurts to stop squatting so he can join. Yeah, <laughs> that's the problem. Mahomes. He's too athletic. Yeah, yeah it's too, too strong. Fit. You got to put on some some like baby fat around the mid waist, and that's right. And then you can win five Super Bowls or whatever, I guess, um, or just be a super lanky, skin and bones guy like Brady was for most of his career. Yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a strange world, <laughs> but all right. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Uh, we will. Be back again soon. You know, if you if you like what you hear, if you put, want to support the reporting that we do, our you know we're an independent independent publication that gets our funding primarily from our memberships. So you know, head on over to the reload.com and buy a membership today. It'll also, of course, get you exclusive access to hundreds of pieces of analysis and the Sunday members newsletter, where you, you'll be the first to read about uh, my my time at the NRA uh, outdoor show. And, uh, of course, you'll get early access to this podcast and the opportunity to appear on the show in a member segment. You know, if you want to be on the show, just reach out on your during your Sunday members newsletter. And just say, hey, I'd love to come on. We'd love to have you. Um, but that's all we've got. And uh, we'll see you guys again real soon. <laughs>